Hello, everybody. Welcome to your favorite Bronze Age comic book podcast, Flea Market Fantasy. This is your co-host, Michael, and as always, I'm joined by... Michael Dell of the LCS Hockey Radio Show. That's right, and this week it is Mike Dell's pick. So we have gone where no comic book reader has gone before. Uh, I have never read this comic. I've heard of it, but that's all I can say about it. And Mike Dell, you can take it from here. Well, this week we're going to be reviewing Dakota North, issue one, June 1986. <laughs> <clears throat> now, Mike Dell, uh, when this came out, I was like 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And I remember the ads. The ads are very iconic. Right, right. Uh, would you like to describe the ad? Yeah, it said, uh, I'm going to look it up right now, but it said style, right? Yeah, like in the middle, there it was like divide, the pages divided into thirds. The, the top and bottom thirds were black, and the top third had style written with like a little dot between each letter. Right. And then in the middle third of the page, uh, it, I think it was just a white background, but uh, it had Dakota North holding up a gun. Right. Like a fat, but she was posed kind of like a fashion model when she was looking like a fashion model. Right. And there's, she was drawn. there's a little bit of cleavage there. Yeah. No bra. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, definitely unusual for the time. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. Like I like I said, I, I still remember those ads from 1986. Mm -hmm. um, but I do not remember anything about the book because I never bought it. Right. <laughs> I, never, I never purchased it. So it was a great ad, but I, I knew she was a detective, mm -hmm. and uh, that was about it. So I figured now, all these years later, what a, what a perfect time to talk about Dakota North, <laughs> because I love Jessica Jones, Michael. You know? Oh, okay. That's right. So, you know, Dakota North's kind of like the predecessor for Jessica Jones. I definitely was thinking that as I was reading it, yes. And also, I guess there was a... Uh, I guess she became a DC character, but she was an independent character named Miss Tree. Have you ever uh, heard of Miss Tree? I was going to bring, that was the number two point I was going to bring up, that the creator of Miss Tree accuses Dakota North of ripping him off. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> that's like saying, well, well, you know, Sam Spade ripped off Philip Marlowe and then Mike Hammer ripped them off. I mean, just because it's a woman private eye, you can have more than one woman private eye. You know? the, but the only point I will give, because the creator was what's is Max Allen Collins, right? I think so. Uh, uh, of uh, Miss Tree. Miss Tree. The only point, yeah, that I'll give him is that there was zero female detectives in comics at this time. Well, well that's fine. But what? So now no one can have another one after he created Miss Tree. Well, I'm just saying that I'm not saying that this is a direct ripoff, but I don't think this would have existed without Miss Tree. And and I didn't even know that until he pointed it out. But he's probably right. Well, the, but the creators of this uh, book were uh, a fellow, uh, a fellow. Well, Tony Sammons is the artist, right? But, so he's he's one of the co-creators. But the lady behind it is Martha Thomas's. I right. guess that's how she says her last name. It's Thomas plural. Thomas's. Weird. Yeah. Or do you think she says it to masses? I want to go with Thomas's. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Good question. But she was the creator, and she created with Larry Hama, and Miss Tree was not a factor in any of their discussions. So, okay. Um, We'll get into the background later. But, uh, yeah, so this Miss Tree, though, they came out with a their own ad. Same design, same look of it, but uh, there said substance. Instead. Oh, yeah? Okay. Which I thought was pretty good. But, um, it, like, the two characters are nothing alike, like, okay. in terms of their background and their history and what they do. So uh, you could say, like, Dakota North is a uh, violent and action pack, but she's not... As like Miss Tree's very violent. She like she'll murder people in cold blood and stuff. She's more like Pulp Fiction, nineteen thirties kind of stuff. Sure, Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. I get that reference. Well, that actually wasn't no. a reference to Pulp <laughs> Fiction kidding. Capital Letter. That was a reference to a small Pulp Fiction. No, I'm <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so yeah, the characters really aren't the same. So okay. I don't know if you could say they she wrote them off, but you know whatever. Uh, so well, we mentioned the creators, um, they were novices, Mike Gale. They were <laughs> novices. Uh, Martha Thomas, Thomas, again, I'm going to struggle with this name. Thomas's <laughs> Martha Thomas's. She had never written a comic book before this. Really? Yeah. Well, well let's just get into her background right away because, uh, this will explain things. Uh, she was born in New York, grew up in Ohio and went to school in Connecticut. 
she lived on a commune for more than a year and was into the anti-war movement and political activism. She huh. was a freelance writer for the Village Voice, High Times, Spy, and National Lampoons. And she worked as a researcher for Norman Mailer on Executioner's Song, 1979, and his subsequent novels. And she based Dakota North on Norris Church Mailer, who is a model art teacher and author who was Norman Mailer's sixth and final wife. Wow, interesting. And if you... And if you Google up uh, Norris Church uh, Mailer, you'll see, yeah, she looks exactly like Dakota North. <laughs> so, okay, interesting. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, are you familiar with the work of uh, Norman Mailer, Michael? No, I'm not, no. His other big uh, book, uh, The Naked and the Dead, that's what he's doing. Okay, Naked. actually, I'm looking at Norris Church Mailer now. Oh, my God, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, she said, uh, like, t- she just described, she just said, hey, make her look like this, and Tony Sammons nailed it, you know? He yeah. All right. So uh, she met Denny O'Neill through a High Times feature, I guess she was doing. Um, mm. And then Denny O'Neill introduced her to Larry Hama, because all three of them had similar political beliefs and stuff. So th- she started talking to Larry about uh, women in comics and how to get like uh, more female-led books started. And Larry was also interested in doing this. So they kicked around some ideas, and uh, they-, they came up with uh, Dakota North. And Very cool. Mm. So he, he let her... Uh, so she was like from the ground. They, this was their project from the start. Um, but she uh, gave, uh, what am I going to say here? She struggled writing uh, violence and action scenes, though, because she's pretty much anti-war, anti-violence, right. peace activist. So her writing uh, violence was very hard for her. So Larry always had to like you know push her to do more. And he would tell her, uh, to write a comic book means to have an unlimited special effects budget. It costs just as much to draw an explosion as it does to draw two people sitting at a diner. So you might as well blow up the world. I think that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, she uh, <laughs> decided comic book writing was not for her. So she just... Uh, the big problem was she said she couldn't write fast enough. Like Her creative process is very slow. <laughs> and so it was tough. And we should say Dakota North was a bi-monthly book. Okay, yep. That's a big distinction. Because we are dealing with two like green creators here. And uh, Larry Hamill is doing a lot of mentoring and getting right. them to these books. Uh, so later, she went on to work for uh, publicity at DC Comics, and she was uh, spearheading the whole Death of Superman hype. Really? In fact, if you Google up like Death of Superman, like the news reports from that time, like y- you'll usually see uh, her quoted as a, uh, a DC executive, like talking about it. Wow. Okay. Um, she still writes a weekly column, or at least she was doing it until the pandemic started, for uh, ComicMix.com. She really? Loves, she she loves comic books. Like hmm. she grew up on them. She loves them, but she just you know, she still wants to write some graphic novels. I think she said she was still working on a graphic novel, but writing a monthly series was just not for her. Mm-hmm. So there you go. So huh. that's uh, the basic of that. <clears throat> um, Never heard of her. Yeah. Well, she only wrote the five books. So mm-hmm. <laughs> five issues, yeah, Dakota North lasted five issues. I don't know if we mm-hmm. said that. That's it. Five issues. So uh, one of the reasons why uh, I guess it got canceled was issue one sold, I think, 120,000 copies. Okay, okay. Which it, today would be a blockbuster success, right? It'd be better than, yeah, Batman, yeah. Yeah, but uh, back then, the cutoff, I guess, was 125,000. Mm. Like, you had to sell that many. So then the second issue came out, and it sold less. Third issue sold less. And at the time, Marvel was going, they were being sold and last week, we couldn't think of the company that owned them at the time. They were called Cadence Industries. Right, right. Okay. Cadence Industries. Mm-hmm. And they sold it to New World Pictures in November of 86. So mm-hmm. they were trying to like streamline the uh, circulation and you know, really cut uh, costs and make it mo- seem more attractive. So some books got cut and uh, Dakota North got cut. Oh, that's too bad. Because it missed that 120, you needed 125,000 sales to be considered profitable. Mm-hmm. They missed it. <laughs> well, what does the highest book sell this these days, Michael? Oh, you know, since 2000, the highest book usually hovers around 100,000. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> she was done after five issues. But she did appear in other books after the cancellation. Uh, her first appearance outside of the Dakota North series was in Web of Spider-Man 37. Really? 
1988. So, Mike, yeah, once you uh, spider cast gets to 1988, look out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've definitely read that issue because I've read, like, all those issues. So Then she appeared in Power Pack 46 in 1989. Huh. You're never going to pick a Power Pack issue for the show. Oh, right? yeah, of course. <laughs> Come you son on. of a bitch. June Brady uh, Simonson. Anyway. She was, a, she was a regular in the Cage series, the Luke Cage series in 1992. Like okay. She appeared in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the first 20 issues. Uh, then she had appearances in Black Panther, 31 and 33 from 1998. Uh, she was in a lot of Daredevil in 1998, hmm. that series that started in 98. She made a lot of appearances in Daredevil. Cool. Um, and then she made her final appearance uh, was in Daredevil 30 from 2011. Again, another, um, what do they call those? Volume. Different volume of Daredevil. Of course, yeah. Got to reboot uh, it. Uh, the series was supposed to be resurrected in 2008, written by C.B. Sabolsky and drawn by Lauren McCubbin. Do you know those people? I know C.B. Sabolsky. Uh, yeah, I don't know the other person. They had even made a promo mm -hmm. image for it, and it was released, uh, but the series never uh, happened. Oh, that's never. too bad. Uh, just two years ago, in 2018, Marvel released a trade paperback, collecting the first five, the only five issues of the <laughs> series. <laughs> only five. <clears throat> and her appearances in uh, Web of Spider-Man and Power Pack, I think. Oh, cool. And, and maybe a couple other appearances. Um, and that's called Design for Dying, which is also the title of this here issue we'll be reviewing today. Hmm. So uh, that's Dakota North. Now, Michael, you said you had some other info about Dakota North. Uh, yeah, and now that we've been talking, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. You know what? Basically, everything you said after Power Pack and Web of Spider-Man was what I was going to tell you oh, okay. about, about her being a Daredevil and all that, and Luke Cage and all that. So Yeah, because I never realized she came back as a regular in Daredevil and Luke Cage. Yeah, it's funny because I read that issue of Web, Web of Spider-Man. I just never put it together that it was the same character, you know? And I guess in Daredevil, they established that she's friends with uh, Jessica Jones. Uh, and I guess, I guess that's a way just to, you know, pay tribute to her. <laughs> that she was Sure. The, and you know that when Jessica Jones was created, Bendis originally wanted her to be Jessica Drew, Spider-Woman, right? Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, and they're like, well, we, we want to do something else with Spider-Woman, so just make her, you know, just change her last name. And so he made her Jessica Jones, and if you remember, she used to be a superhero called, what was it? Like, it was something weird, like Crystal or... Yeah, something, it was something like that. She like wore like a, a white costume with like a purple right. jewel stuff. wasn't it jewel i can't remember okay but anyway so they even made fun of that in the uh netflix show right they showed her hold up a costume that looks right cool. right so anyway that's dakota north and uh she is a private detective she specializes in the fashion industry because there's lots of shenanigans in the fashion industry <laughs> yeah so I think uh, we can get into the issue. That's pretty much all we need to say about Dakota North, right? All right. Uh, I, you know, the first thing I'm going to say, well, actually, no, I'll wait to get to the end. But, oh, well, th well, there's one other point we should make, Michael. Sure. When this came out in 86, this was the only female-led book at Marvel. Wow. Which is really important. And that, <laughs> she was... that is also ludicrous, if you ask me, yeah. but... Wow. I guess they. I guess there was a Firestar limited series that had just ended. Okay. But th this is a regular series, you know. Sure. Of course, it didn't last as long as most limited series, but still. Yeah. It was intended. <laughs> yeah. To it be didn't a last regular as long series. As Squadron Supreme, which was a limited series. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. So it's it's pretty uh, significant book in the history of comic books when you think about it. Right. So. Right. Wow, okay. All right, so Dakota North, issue number one. Let's look at the cover. So we got Marvel 25th anniversary, right? End of the Bronze Age. We like to talk yep. about it a lot. Dakota <laughs> North investigations, and then there's a little subtitle, New York, Paris, Rome, Tokyo. Cool. Well, yeah, it's like, it's like her business card. Right, you, yeah, yeah, you, okay. You, you see the lipstick up in the top right, right corner to show she's a sexy lady. And then, uh, yeah, she has offices in New York, Paris, Rome, and Tokyo. We'll talk about that in a minute because that seems a little ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, the cover's great. 
It's uh, she's riding a motorcycle and she's brandishing a gun. Now, do you think the gun is meant to be firing there? I think that pink circle is just to highlight it, right? Like she's I, not I actually... don't know. I think she's firing. I think it's a stylized, like, you know, whatever that's called, muzzle flash. See, I don't think it is a muzzle flash. I think it's just like to highlight that she has a gun. Oh, maybe. I don't know. It's interesting. Interesting. Um, but yeah, there, there's some guys in ski masks and uh, hats and guns. And they're like, looks like they're taking people hostages. And she drives up with her motorcycle. Just jumping right into him with her gun on. She's actually just come down a flight of stairs. Yes. Which is, yeah, this is actually really well designed because you see the legs. Oh, actually, you see the girl, like the woman on the on the stairs, peeking through. Yeah. The, yeah, between the corner box and the logo. And you can see her face all shocked. And then the, the guy who's getting either shot or hit with a pink bubble, uh, <laughs> his hat is like popping off. So that's cool because it shows motion, right? Oh, do you think maybe – look at how the hat is uh, – see the, the, the band around the hat? Like, it looks oh, like there's a hole in it. Oh, so, maybe so maybe sensor? she did shoot, and she put a bullet right through his hat. Right. And maybe it's kind of been brushed, airbrushed out or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's – huh, interesting. Yep. Right. And then it's cool because in the foreground is another guy holding a gun to a woman, but they're darkened out so they don't clutter, you know, the shot. So this and you is can actually, see on on the right side, there's a lady and her kid, and there's also right. like a, a a poster that says "sale." So right, it tells you like they're inside a department store, probably. Right, it's actually like really good composition. Yep, it's a great cover. I love the cover. Yep, and uh, in the little character box, like you said, it had Marvel 25th anniversary, and then you got a little picture of Dakota North peeking around, and she's got her gun, and it's smoking. She yep, shot somebody. Uh huh. Seventy five cents. Uh huh. And then ninety five in Canada. <laughs> Fuck you, Canada. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right, so then the big splash page says Dakota North. Oh, yeah, so so we get a, one of those classic splash pages that tricks you, right? Yep. So we see a guy shooting somebody. Uh, he's like, Dakota, look out, eat leg, geek face. And then Dakota North is kind <laughs> of, she's kind of behind him, but it looks like she's almost like back to back with him. And then at the bottom, it says, Design for Dying. And on the left, it introduces the cast, Dakota, Ricky, SJ, Mad Dog, Amos, and Cleo. And Dakota, of course, is our hero. Uh, Ricky is her little brother, her 12-year-old little brother. SJ is her father, Samuel J. North. He's a former CIA operative. Um, Mad Dog is the guy who's yelling, Eat Lead Geek Face. And he's like her assistant in the New York office. And Amos, uh, Detective Amos, or Sergeant, I think he's a detective, but he's on the uh, you know New York City uh, police officer. And Cleo, you can tell she's evil because she's smoking one of those cigarettes with the holder. Right, right. That's always a clear giveaway. But she's like the uh, ultimate villain here in all this, this Cleo lady. Right, yeah. Uh, wish me luck remembering all these different characters as we go through, yeah. but I'll do my best. <laughs> Yeah, so then, like you said, we get the picture of the of uh, Mad Dog shooting you know, and uh, Eat Lead Geek Face. And you see, like, a silhouette in the front, right. the way the image is framed. Like, there's an arm sticking out in the body. And Dakota, I love this picture. This is great art, though. Like, the Dakota, yep. the, the energy in Dakota's form and his form, it's great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but then we, surprise, we cut to the next page. We find out he didn't actually shoot anybody. It was just a cardboard cutout. They're just kind of in, like, a... Like a, not a shooting range, but I don't know what you'd call this, but like a training area. Yeah, it's kind of like her danger room. Right, that's right. It. Except it's just a cardboard cutout of an old woman. <laughs> yeah, they pop up off the floor. Right, they right. React, and he shot an old lady. And, you know, it's cool. I, I actually like this, the way the art and the dialogue plays together, because after they finish chatting, uh, she's like... Um, uh, now get the phone if it's a bill collector or my dad... Or my dad, get rid of him. And then we, his dialogue is, I hear master and I obey. But the silhouette is him walking yeah. like a zombie. So I think yeah. that's kind of cool. Like his arm straight out. Right. And his postures. Not straight. like a zombie, but like an automaton, you know, whatever yeah. you want to say. Yeah. So that's cool. Um, now, we should say, though, she's already talking about bill collectors and stuff like that. Yet she supposedly has an office in New York, Paris, London, and Tokyo. I... I think it would be better if she had, if they established that she just lied about all these offices. Right. Because this whole issue, it's like she's struggling to get money and 
how are you having all these offices up? It, it doesn't really make sense. It's, right. Um, well, see, I, I read that as just that's where she works. It doesn't mean maybe she doesn't have offices there. Maybe that's just where she goes. I don't know. No, nah, later it, it comes out that she actually has offices. Uh, okay. Have you read ahead past issue one? Uh, I flipped through them. Okay. But, uh, I probably will go back and read them, though. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, there's only five of them, so you might as yeah. well. Um, but yeah, I think they do set up that she actually has like offices operating in those mm. cities, but I don't know. I, I, or maybe they do come out later and say it's all kind of like fake, but, um, I don't know. We'll see. So yeah, the phone's ringing and also that, uh, yeah, detective, uh, Coolhane, Amos Coolhane is his full name. He's, he's coming in as well. He, he comes into the, uh, little danger room as well. So right. Mad Dog's answering the phone and talking to Amos, and he needs to talk to Dakota. Um, but she says, just keep the uh, the call on the speakerphone, because i got to finish this maneuver. Right. And she's got to shoot some things still. And uh, so on page three, Michael, look at that first picture of Dakota North. That is Mark Silvestri now. Like that art, it's like... Uh, it's similar, very, yep. Very much Mark Silvestri to me. Yeah, you could say that. Um, and again, this is 86, so it's like, uh, I think uh, we'll get into the art much more later, but there's a lot in here that reminds me of John Romita Jr. and a lot that reminds me of Mark Silvestri. That's a good, yeah. It definitely reminds me of other artists, but I have to think about who, because, you know, again, I was exposed to Tony Salmon's art when I was a kid on G.I. Joe, and so, yeah, I kind of grouped him in with a lot of other artists like that. So yeah, we'll and, and, we, and again, this is 86, so it's like before Silvestri was really established right so it's not like he's cheating or copying off them it's just you know an interesting thing like oh sure um, definitely yeah so take it away michael she gets the call who's calling her so this is let's see this is otto right no 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 otto's the bad guy oh otto's the bad guy this is luke jacobson right this is the guy with the long blonde hair yeah it kind of looks like thor and, right. Uh, he's a big fashion designer. Right. Which is like, Miss, Ms. North, you've got to help me. I've been threatened in the most vicious manner. And uh, so then she finishes her maneuver. <laughs> yeah, shooting things. And then, uh, and then she's like, okay, so yeah, um, looks like we're going to have a big payday. So yeah, this sounds like a good deal. So, so then she, <laughs> this is, okay, this is kind of weird. So she agrees to meet him. So she jumps on her motorcycle. motorcycle. I love the panel of her uh, ejecting the cartridge from the gun, though. You just see her legs and, like, the cartridge. Yeah, the yeah. Pock hitting the ground. Yeah, it's a good shot. So, yeah, this motorcycle is just sitting there. It says exit, and then she gets on it. That's a nice shot. I mean, you know, I appreciate the attention to detail in that shot of... <laughs> Showing off her, her, her ass. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um... And, you know, I'll, I, I got a point. We'll talk about this more later, but this dialogue is all good. You know, it's all very realistic. It's not typical comic book dialogue of 1986, right? Yeah, for 86, it's very good, yeah. Right, right. You know, um, she's like... Yeah, sh yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, she's like, I'm sure it's nothing serious. These fashion guys are afraid of their own shadows. You just stay as cute as you are, Amos. And then he's got this big grin on his face. And then he's like, Mad Dog, did she just call me sweetie? She sure did, you devil. And then she's off yeah, on she, her cycle. She says, catch you later, sweetie. And then she takes yeah, it off right, on the Yeah, right, right, right. Right. That's a good shot of her taking off on the motorcycle, too. So now this, okay, this seems a little wonky. Yeah, it is good. So then she <laughs> pulls in through an elevator? <laughs> yeah, she rides her motorcycle right up an elevator and into the offices of this fashion place. Right. And everyone there assumes she's a model. Yes. So they're, they're telling her, you know, leather's out. Because she wears, like, leather... Uh, yeah, we should describe Dakota North. She's, like, short red hair. Like, mm -hmm. a sharp-edged fashion kind of cut. Um, and then she wears, like, black leather pants and a black kind of, like, well, jacket. It's a, it's a green, green jacket. Oh, that, oh, yeah, I guess she's taking... It is a green jacket. Yeah. Oh, but I'm talking... Well, she put the green jacket on over top. But, I mean, her normal... When she's in shooting and stuff... Actually, no, it's like, green. It's green the whole way through. Holy it's hell, like, yeah. It's not it's a jacket. Worn. Yeah, it's like an open, very low-cut shirt. Well, what's underneath, though? You see, oh. I think it's a little jacket over... I'm so confused. 
You know what? You know what's funny? She has black on underneath, like blue, well, blue or black, whatever. Okay, this is what's confusing. Page one, it's black. Then all of a sudden, her shirt is green. I think it's a shirt. No, it's it's no. Sorry, you're right. It's a it's a green jacket over her like full body suit or yeah, like a leather cat suit. Yeah, that's what it. You're right. Okay. So then when she comes in, they're like, oh, my dear, you are quite late. We have no time for temperamental models today. Hurry up and get into this. But like, this is kind of ridiculous, but okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let it go. So she <laughs> takes off her green jacket. And yeah, and her back is naked there. So I guess the little cat suit has an open back. Right, right, right. <laughs> and uh, so then by the next page, she's, in, she's now wearing a yellow, like a long dress. Yeah, and this dress does not look like anything a fashion person would wear. No, no it doesn't. It doesn't look good at all. Um, so then she's like, so this is another thing. I, okay, this threw me off. So then she's, so then this guy hands her this like small kind of, not a briefcase, but like a little. It's a makeup case. case. Oh, a makeup case. So yeah, he says, you can't go in meeting uh, Jacobson like this. You need to fix yourself up, darling. Here, take this makeup case. Right, right. She, yeah. Here, take this and see if you can even up those skin tones. And then she's like, this is the heaviest makeup case. And then we see, uh, what's her name, with the, with smoking the cigarette? Cleo. Cleo. And then we see, what's his name, SJ? No, not SJ. Uh, no, this is Jacobson, that designer. Jacobson, that. right, Thor. Yes. And <laughs> so... Uh, well, so, maybe I, I should give some background here. Uh, Cleo, the, the mastermind, the evil mastermind behind all this, she's trying to take over her company. I think it's called like Rycon or something like that. Right, and, it, and in order to take control of the company, her plan is to make the stock crash, and then she'll buy it all up. All right. 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 So their company, Rycon, just purchased the Jacobson Fashion Company. So right. he sold his company to them. So in order to make everything crash, she's trying to sabotage his fashion company. Right. That's what's really going on here behind the scenes. So right. like they had someone vandalize his offices. And they're trying to scare him and because and, he has this big showing coming up and they're trying to tank the showing and make it a big failure. And so that's basically the background here of what's happening. Right. Okay. So, pardon me. So, um, so, so yeah, he's like kind of, you know, like adjusting her clothes. He's like, if you, my dear Miss Vander Vanderlip, had not convinced this high tech company to diversify into fashion, I'd have to keep my own books. I'm so happy now that I can afford such nice fabrics to play with. So they're so they're like just chatting back and forth. And then Dakota North's got this makeup case, and she's like, I don't think this is a makeup case. And then there's just a blank look on her face. Out of my way, toots! And she just throws <laughs> this thing out toots. the window, and it explodes because it was a bomb. Yeah. So yeah. Um, <laughs> Which is crazy because uh, if Cleo's the mastermind behind all this, she almost killed herself. <laughs> yeah, a weird scene there. A weird scene. Um, yeah, but, but she could have said it like she heard it ticking or something too. Or right. Something. It was just, oh, this thing's heavy. It's got to be a bomb. I'm throwing it out the window. <laughs> right. And then, and then, and so this is also where she's like, she kind of gives up, like, okay, I'm not going to go along with this whole model thing. So in the last panel, she's like, I'm Dakota. Oh, crap. I got an ad pop up. She's like, I'm Dakota <laughs> North. Now I can see. Now can I see Mr. Jacobson? Yeah. So the scene, the scene cuts. And the next panel, we see her little brother, Ricky, yelling. But notice uh, the narration box here. Across town in the best video arcade in the galaxy. Right. <laughs> so, right. It is 1986. <laughs> yes. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah. So, she, so he is arguing with his father. Because that's he's the, Dakota. Yes, that's huh? Dakota yeah. North's father as well. And, and right. uh, that's SJ, and he's in a wheelchair. Right, right, right. And, uh, yeah, I'm just kind of, again, this is good art. Like, it's showing the details of what's going on. And then we see, so he's got, like, a little, well, I guess it's a ghetto blaster, you'd call it. And we see a hand reaching into the panel, and it's, like, this little punk kid. And he actually pulls a gun on the kid. Um, yeah, the kid's going to steal the radio, and SJ, the father, pulls the gun on the kid. Right, right, right. Because right. Ricky is playing the video game the whole time. And we should say R Ricky wears like a suit and a pencil thin black tie right. and sunglasses. Right. But he looks like 12 or something. Yes, he is 12. Yep. Okay. So then uh, the, the, the hooligan kid runs off and then they're arguing back and forth. And he's like, I don't want to go live with her. And then the father's like, okay, how about I pay you $200 a, a week? And he's like, okay. 
Sounds good. Very worthwhile. Yeah, because the father wants Ricky to go live with Dakota North because right. he has some business dealings coming up and he's not going to be around to take care of the kid. So he does, and, and the, the little brother does not want to go live with his older sister. So the dad pays him $200 a week to go live with his older sister. And the, the other thing here is um, we see Ricky doesn't even like bad, not while well, he's wearing sunglasses, but he doesn't <laughs> bat an eye when uh, SJ pulls out a gun and threatens a kid with it. So that right. tells you that this family is a little unique. You know, right. It's a little, a little strange. So I, now, I, should also, I should also say Dakota North's backstory here, Michael. She, uh, she was a child model, and she was a model in her younger days. So uh, that, that's why she has these ties to the fashion industry. And her dad, well, like I said, was a CIA guy. Mm. And their mom died in a car explosion, supposedly accidental. Okay. But it seems like the dad's always trying to find who did it. And uh, the dad did not want Dakota North to become a private detective. So there's uh, okay. lots of animosity between the dad and the daughter. Okay, so this, uh, what's Thor's name again? Luke? I think so. Jacob sends his last name, I think. Yeah, I think it's Luke. Okay, so this is where he explains what you're kind of just talking about. Ever since Rycom bought my company, I've received, I've received dreadfully nasty letters and phone calls. I didn't think much about it at first, except that it upset Anna, my assistant. So this is where we start throwing names around where I start getting confused. But then <laughs> Luke's like, uh, but then someone threw a stink bomb into my office the day women's wear was uh, was to interview us. After that incident, Cleo Vanderclip suggests that I call you. She said she had known your father years ago and had followed your career with great interest. She thought you'd be the perfect one to protect me and my clothes, of course. I'm so thrilled that I listened to her, Dakota. I think there's a little bit of uh, sexual tension there because, you know, she's Yeah, very but I, I think, like, he, it turns out like he's kind of gay, though. Oh, okay. So, well, But he wants to marry her, even oh. though he's... He's kind of a gay, but uh, <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, also, we should mention Cleo has a back, like she, like he said, Cleo suggested to cut her north because she knew her, her father. So she's had run-ins with her father, her father, and their enemies. Mm, okay. Cleo and SJ are enemies, right? Okay. So, oh yeah, and so by the way, so there's there's been a guy who's kind of been watching them, although we didn't really see him before this point, but now he's on a phone. And so he's like calling in to somebody. Oh, it's actually Ms. Uh, Vanderclip. And then a security guard sees him and he's, he's got like a gun, you know, underneath his jacket. So he's like, you got a paper for that iron? And he's like, no. And then he just punches him in the face, knocks him over. <laughs> yes. and, then, and then he's like, as he's walking away, he's like, I hate modern art. And we see like this modern art painting. It's like a cartoon recreation of a guy getting punched out. And it says, pow. It's kind of funny. Yeah, because uh, Jacobson and Dakota North were talking at a... Uh... Right, an art gallery, right? Yeah. Right. And uh, we should say this is Otto. You mentioned Otto earlier. This is Otto. Oh, this right. is Otto. Yeah, he's yeah. a guy who Cleo hired to sabotage Jacobson and eventually kill Dakota. Oh, right, right. Yeah, the bad guy's Otto. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now, so this is, okay, so now we cut over to the Rycom building, which he was just talking about. And now we see Ms. Vanderclip. Yeah, and Cleo. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, Cleo. Uh, just to make sure everyone knows, Miss Vanderclip is Cleo, the evil mastermind. Right, right, right. And, and so her secretary is Anne or Anne Anna. Or, so. or I guess that's Jacobson's secretary. Right, right, right. So, right, so we already kind of know. Like, this is like you know, we know. Even though the heroes don't know what's going on, we know what's going on, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, Ms. Vanderclip's like, they're fools, Anna. They don't suspect a thing. So Anna is actually working for Ms. Vanderclip, even though she's the other guy's assistant, uh, right. Luke's assistant. Yes. Does Otto sus Okay, so yeah, these bubbles are kind of out of order, I think. Right? The right, uh, the right bubble should come first, actually. Hmm. Yeah, so in a comic book, usually you'd put the right bubble up higher, just so the reader knows which one to read first, but it's kind of confusing. But anyway. So then she's like, Otto suspects nothing but checks, Miss, Miss Stasio. As long as he's paid in cash, he trusts me totally. So, so yeah, she's basically setting him up, as we said earlier. And she's also trying to set up Dakota. Like right, she wants, right, right. She wants Otto to kill Dakota to get back at Dakota's father. Well. Uh -huh. Yeah, right, right, what she says here. And then there's kind of a weird, like, this is all good art, which we'll talk about later, but there's an awkward shot at the bottom where there's this huge empty space on the right. You notice that? Yeah. Or, yeah, it, it almost thinks like uh, it almost seems like uh, uh, Sandman's expected there to be more word bubbles over there. Right, like or that bubble could have just gone there, but instead it's over the chair. But whatever, it's good. 
So then we cut back to Dakota North, and she's oh, and we get a little note here from the editor back at Dakota's office. And so she's back. Oh yeah, and so now she's uh, she's talking to her other cohorts. Uh, yeah. I don't remember. Which, this huh? is the detective. This is the detective. He oh. he had waited there because he heard about the bomb explosion. Oh right. And I guess, and I guess his chief wanted him to talk to Dakota about it. Right. So he he hung around the whole time just to talk to Dakota when she got back about the bomb. Right. So. Now they're upstairs. Yeah, she invites him upstairs into her uh, apartment. So I think, Mike, we might be getting some sweet, sweet love here. Look awesome. out, something, something could be happening. But uh-oh, someone well, knocks at the door. Yeah, Who is it? and it's Alex P. Keaton. <laughs> yes, um, Ricky. Yeah, with his sunglasses and his skinny tie, he comes through and right away starts rifling through the uh, refrigerator, right? Yep. You call this refrigerator? Hey, do you get cable down the, this far downtown? <laughs> yeah, it's 1986. Right. I didn't have cable until the 90s, but anyway. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he sits down next to the guy, and he's like, well, I better go. And uh, he gives her a kiss on the kind of the side of the eye or the side of the forehead. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Detective uh, Amos Coolhane gives her a kiss on the side of the head. And, uh, yeah, Ricky's like, hey, he's the snappy dresser. And she's like, Ricky. She's right. Right. <laughs> right. She was going to have some sweet, sweet loving, and Ricky ruined it. So. Yep. So now we cut back to, oh, yeah, so now Dakota North is kind of, yeah, she's in disguise now. She's undercover. Yeah, and they, don't they say that in, like, the uh, box? Yeah, it says Dakota plays, the next morning, Dakota plays girl reporter to interview lavish dress designer Kirsch at his showroom. So she goes in to try to get some information from this guy. Yeah, but, to, to see if he knows who could be, because she thinks he's a rival of Jacobs and maybe he's doing the sabotage. Right. She's trying to gets uh, some info about him but basically his his the other workers kind of scare her away right but this one guy's got these knives <laughs> yeah this kirsch fella he's talking to her and then it, the one panel he's like pointing over his shoulder and you see the guy holding a knife in the foreground and the guy it's like at an old carnival where they just throw knives at the lady strapped to the board right right he just starts throwing knives at her <laughs> and, and like like landing all around her on the wall or pinning her clipboard to the wall and because uh, the designer guy's like, I know you're not a news reporter. Who are you? Did uh, Cleo send your, I think Cleo, did he says Cleo or Miss Vanderclip send you here to drive me nuts? And uh, what does Dakota do, Michael? She takes one of the knives out of the wall and just throws it back at the guy. Right. Hits, the, hits his clipboard. No, no, that was her clipboard that got pinned. Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah. She just, okay. She throws it and it lands over the guy's shoulder. And the knife thrower guy's just laughing like, hey, that's right. pretty good. Yeah, it's great. See you later, toots. It's been real. Yeah, yeah she calls everybody toots. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then the dude's like, everything's going exactly as planned, sweetest Cleo. Yes, I think we can go on to the next phase. Yeah, because Cleo comes in after Dakota leaves. Right. Yeah, and that's a cool panel because it's the same, it's, you know, the same time, but it's split up to show like maybe a few moments have passed when she comes yeah, in. Yeah, there's like a panel break in the middle right. of one giant picture. Right. Um, so then we get to the next morning at RICOM office. Uh, Dakota North is talking to Cleo and Jacobson. She's updating the case. And I think they screwed up here with the one dialogue bubble because these two guys in ski, ski masks bust in the door and they start shooting gas in the room. And we get a, a, a shot of Dakota saying, what is the meaning of this? I think that was probably meant to be Cleo saying that. Because that does not sound like... The yeah, thing. you're right, you're right. It sounds like a phony cover line. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right, huh. And then, so yeah, so they come in, and they, yeah, they, they fire off some gas, and then, um, oh yeah, so they, they, they're they kidnapping, uh, what's his name, right, Luke? Yeah, Jake, the fashion designer guy. Right. And then they're like, then they're like forget the broad, shove Goldilocks into the elevator and ride. <laughs> and so then she's like, she's commenting how the, she, you know, the stairs are probably quicker than the elevator. So she runs down, but the car gets away. And this is actually really good storytelling. I, I just want to point out, this is one page and it's one full scene, right? Like the first panel of the page is the establishing shot. And the last panel of the page is just her watching a car speed away. So it's really cool because if you could imagine if this was like an old Sunday strip, this would almost be like, you know, that's all the story you'd get for the week. And you have to wait till the next week for the next scene. But it's kind of cool. You know? So, yes. Oh, I agree. <laughs> so she hops She hops on her motorcycle and she's chasing the car. And to get away from her, they pull into the uh, 
freight elevator for a department store called Bloomies. Right. I guess is a takeoff on Bloomingdale's. And so they say, uh, see you later, sweetheart. <laughs> Some yeah. other time, sweetheart. And so they go up the freight elevator. I don't know why they think that would get them to safety. Right, right, right. They're going up in a building, so now they're confined to the building somehow, but they figure, oh, we're free. We're free and clear now. So. Well, it, and it's also like, once again, she's, you know, she's already been on an elevator. Now she's riding her stairs up an escalator, or her motorcycle up an escalator. Yeah, she just crashes her motorcycle through a department store window and starts riding it up the escalator. <clears throat> and, and one of the people there, Michael, looking at Dakota North, do you see what he says? Yeah. Well, his thought bubble is, I wonder if I could get Agnes to wear something like that. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Because <laughs> she's in her black cat suit. Right. Yeah. So then she, uh, now there's a big shootout. Yeah, she chases them all the way up the escalators and the stairs, and she somehow finds them. She knows where they're going. I don't know how. Right. Um, and they start shooting at her, and she's, they're shooting her motorcycle. <laughs> and then, I don't know. Yeah. It's, they just give up. Like, she never even returns fire. Right. They, they're, they're just shooting at her the whole time. And they're like, all right, this isn't worth all the hassle. Let's get out of here. And they, they drop off Jacobson. And uh, that's it. Right. So then she's just back at home with her little brother. watching, And he's watching TV. And, and again, huh? Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, she's kind of mad that uh, the little brother's just goofing off and not doing anything. So she says she's going to teach him uh, some self-defense lessons and she just judo flips him on the ground. Right. And it's kind of funny because it's hard to describe the art unless you're looking at it, but I think the art style lends itself to some really dry humor. Cause like the way that he like flips her over or she flips him over and then kind of just walks away. It, it's just, and then she's like, uh, less. Oh yeah. She's like, that's the learn. We put in Luke's showroom, got to run, listen to his dishwashing. And it's just funny because you can see, like, he lands in, like, the bag of chips with all the chips <laughs> flying out. Like, everything's knocked on the ground. It's just really well done, you know? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I'm a big fan as well. Yeah. And then it cuts to the next page. And uh, now she's at Luke's. And uh, the place is all destroyed. And yeah, she, yeah. She's talking to the, his uh, assistant, Anna. Anna. Or, Anna. Anna. And, <clears throat> of course, Anna's in on it with Cleo. Right. And so Anna lets it slip that she heard these guys talking that they're going to go pick up some papers at a warehouse. Right. So Dakota has, is going to go to this warehouse to try and uh, get the bad guys. Right. So now we cut to the docks. Now, he, so yeah, again, the storytelling is clear, but this is like a weird part. So, so they pull. So Dakota and Luke pull up. They get out, and then we see a close up of her throwing the keys to him, and she's like. Here are the keys. Make that 15 minutes. And then he's like, don't worry. I'll keep them right here with the extra ammunition. And then we see like a little highlight around the keys. Oh, okay. They're falling out. I thought that he yes. just missed them. They fall out of his pocket and they land on the ground. Okay. So yeah, that yeah, was my he meant, he meant to put them in the pocket and he missed. Okay. okay. <laughs> and they're falling on the ground. I thought he just didn't catch them. Okay. Uh, Dakota, and then he's like, Dakota, Dakota, but she's already gone. Yeah. Cause she told him if I'm not out in a half hour, uh, start to get out of here. Go get help. Right, get right. Which, which comes back later. It's kind of funny. But anyway, so now we got these guys uh, making a deal, right? They're like in this warehouse. Yeah, like, this is Otto, and uh, I think it's Cleo, right? She's giving them, selling them papers, or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Otto, and yeah, I don't know. But then, but then uh, Cleo's like, uh, in her thought bubble, she's like, these papers are worthless. Right. Have... Right, and then uh, Dakota North comes up from this sort of trap door on the floor. Or I guess they're in an attic, maybe, eh? They're probably in an attic or something. I don't know. A different floor. So then she bursts through. He's like, okay, Shanks, that's enough. You're coming with me. And then uh, this guy's like, I don't think so, lady. I found this guy outside. Boss. Oh, yeah, so this is Luke. And he's like, I'm sorry, Dakota. It was so boring in the car. <laughs> <laughs> just, he just came in. That's so funny. Yeah. And, then he's, and then she's like, I guess you're ready for some excitement, Luke. And then she just starts shooting. And uh, it hits, like, the light or whatever. So now there's a big shootout. And uh, she grabs him, and they run outside. And then he's like, Lu and then this is funny. Luke, start the car up. Let's get out of here. I'll hold him off as long as you need. And then he's like, uh, Dakota, I seem to have misplaced the keys. And then she's like, they better be on the ground, not inside. Look for them. And so then, of course, Ricky's there. Ricky, how did you get here? Yeah. Hi, guys. I called Luke's, and this Anna chick said you were down here. <laughs> she was surprised you had a brother, Dakota. So, like, hey, 
Go ahead. Or you should say Ricky's got a gun in his right hand and his skateboard right. in his left. Yeah, what in the <laughs> Yeah, this is ridiculous. I love it, though. And Ricky, by the way, that panel of Ricky, if you told me John Romita Jr. drew that, I'd be like, yep, that's John Romita Yeah, Jr. and you know what? Like, specifically on Daredevil, when he was teamed with Andal Senti, yeah. he just has a very similar vibe to that. Very similar. Specifically how he draws the clothes, the baggy clothes. Mm -hmm. um, very John Romita Jr. of this era. Yeah. Right. And then she actually did this little callback to a previous joke. She's like, I guess lesson two isn't going to be dishwashing here. Do it like this. And so, the, and so then now behind them, uh, so, then, uh, so this is what's weird. So then one of the group from the building is like, Dakota, I don't mean to repeat myself, but if you look behind you, is that? But no, that's, ja that's Jacobson saying. Okay, okay. So then they look behind them and it's Otto. That's far enough, Otto. And Otto's like, if your father couldn't stop me, Ms. North, you don't have a prayer. And then, and then she just shoots him. I don't pretty much toots, brack, brack, shoots him. He's dead. <laughs> yeah, that was a little, it was a little easy, you know? Right, yeah, yeah. Could have been a little more uh, difficult in killing Otto, but nope, bang, bang. Yeah. Right. And then, and then uh, the kid's like, that was cool, Dakota. And she's like, it would be cooler if we knew who we worked for. And then, and then it's uh, Ms. What, Vander, whatever? Yeah, Cleo. It's easy right, she's like, too bad he didn't kill her, at le kill her. At least I won't have to pay for his exorbitant fee. We'll meet again, Ms. North, and you'll pay for this. And then we, uh, we got one more little scene here, a little wrap-up at a party at Luke's. And they're basically just chatting it up. Yeah, because he had his big fashion reveal. His line was, you know, it was a big success and everything. And, right. And, like, it, it's just... He asked her to marry him right away. He's like, yeah. you'll be my inspiration for decades. Won't you marry me? And she's like, not this time. I have to go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And then, and then, uh, what's his name? Uh, who's this? Is this Mad Dog? No, no, who's that's the detective. detective. He's like, I'll come with you. Okay, Amos, but I'm not marrying you either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then they get back to her office, and there's Mad Dog and Ricky both dressed alike in the most 80 outfits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They got spiked hair, sunglasses, yellow shirts, suspenders, and real baggy pants. And their collars are put, pushed up on their shirts. Right. And, uh, and then basically, the big reveal at the end here is, uh, hey, uh, Dakota North's like, hi, guys, are you, aren't you cute? Any calls? And, uh, and he's like, uh, just your dad. He said to tell you your husband is in town, but I'll meet you for dinner at the Rainbow Room uh, at 8. Husband? I didn't know you had a husband, boss. Yes, yeah, sis. When did this happen? And that's the cliffhanger. <laughs> Next, <laughs> Petrix. Yeah, the final panel is just Dakota North looking at him like, oh, shit. Right. <laughs> they know about right. the husband now. <laughs> there you go. That's Dakota North issue one. Yeah, uh, I really enjoyed it, Michael. I don't know. It's you can you can tell it's a, a novice comic book writer and a novice comic book artist at times. Like there are some clunky things in there, and um, uh, but it's still the people involved are talented. Right. And there's a lot of energy to it. Um, there is a lot of style to it. <laughs> the art so i'm a big fan actually i enjoyed this yeah i really enjoyed it like in fact reading it like not reading it but skimming through the second time i kind of noticed more details yeah. and again it's like if this came out i think this could come out right now in 2020 and you it, it would it would hold up like it's not dated yeah, you know? i agree i mean yeah. other than the obvious 80s stuff i mean sure yeah. but the actual it's not like it's got you know, really bad narration or thought bubbles or ex over explanation, you know? Well, well, I think the reason why it's uh, well written in terms of dialogue and stuff and characters and stuff is because she was a freelance writer for other things. And, you know, she right. was a mailer and like she wasn't a kid who loved comic books and just started writing. She was actually exactly. a writer. Exactly. Um, I was, was going to say something else about it. Um, yeah, like the, the, the problems with the writing. It's like the uh, the pacing and the sequential storytelling. Because she said she didn't know how to do that. Like to tell. Sure. Like she said when she thought you just wrote it, like you would write a, write a prose piece. But then Larry Hamm would always give it back to her and say, you got to, this will not help the artist at all. You got to give the artist something to work with. Sure, sure. Yeah. It's like she didn't understand how to do that. Sure. And so you can see, you can get a sense of that here. Yeah. Some of the story elements. Like there, there seem to be like maybe some beats missing or um, just, just right. like some disjointedness at times. Sure. 
but it's still very uh, well written overall. So. Well, that's the thing. It, again, it reminds me. There's another female writer named Mindy Newell or Newell, who did a Lois Lane miniseries, did a few issues of Wonder Woman. She never really did much, but she also had a background in just writing prose and who knows what else. But again, it, it, yeah, it doesn't come off as a typical. And no offense, I don't want to offend anybody, but like when you read like Marv Wolfman or Len Wein or Denny O'Neill, it just seems like guys that grew up loving Stan Lee or loving whatever. Yes. And just regurgitating it, whereas this feels like a real writer, you know? Yeah, there's always a difference when someone's a writer who comes in and does comics and someone who's just a fan who writes comics. Exactly, exactly. Big difference. Um, <clears throat> well, we talked about Martha uh, earlier, let, so let's talk about Tony Sammons, uh, he, the artist here. He was born in 19... We should say he also inked this, right? Right, right. Uh, he was born in 1957 in Rolla, Missouri. And his first comics work uh, for Marvel was uh, Conan Saga 76, Doctor Strange 64, and Amazing High Adventure 1, all in 1984. Mm, um, okay. What is Amazing High Adventure? I meant to look that up. Or do you have any? The only thing I know about it is Steve Englehart did a couple issues, and I think it's just one of those uh, experimental magazines that didn't really go anywhere. And it, it was like an anthology series, but that's all I know about it. Yeah, I was wondering if it, like... Um, if it had like superheroes or if it was more like Kazar and that kind of stuff, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I'm just looking up number one. I think it's just, it, it's almost like, uh, I, I don't know, but from the looks of it, it's almost like, you know, heavy metal magazine. No, I'm not familiar with okay. it. I've well, heard just, of it, but I've never yeah, seen it's it. Yeah, it's just an anthology. It's like, I think whatever people wanted to do, they could do, but there's definitely no superheroes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so that Dr. Strange 64 <clears throat> that he did in 1984 uh, Jim Shooter at a meeting held up that book to everyone in, at the meeting and said, this is not what a Marvel comic should look like. Really? But, yes, he was not a fan. Huh. And so he, uh, the only way he still got work was because Larry Hama liked them and uh, otherwise none of the other editors would hire him because they didn't want Shooter to get mad at him. Mm -hmm. So Hama got him to do Dakota North 1 through 5 and he actually hired him uh, at a urinal. <laughs> they were in the <laughs> they were in the men's room, and uh, they were just zipping up. And uh, Hamma said, "You can draw pretty much better than anyone here, um, so why don't you just? I got a book for you." And he says, "But your storytelling is shit. We need to really? work on storytelling." Hmm. So Hamma like really took him under his wing. And Salmon said it was like the toughest uh, job he ever had because uh, Hamma would always made him like redo so many pages. But he said it was great because unlike other editors who would make you do something if they didn't like it or something, he said, <clears throat> Ham always explained why you had to do it differently. Like right. Why right. it wasn't working. And that's what good teachers do. They don't just tell you to do something. They tell you why you to do it. And so he, he, he's like very complimentary of Ham and said he was a huge influence on his career. And he really spun him in a different direction artistically. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. It's always good to hear about Larry Hama doing good that's things. That's right. I love Larry Hama. Yep. Yeah, but look at Larry taking these two novice creators and you know, trying to do what he can to well, get them going. Yeah, and the other thing is, is it's like, again, if this was published today, I know you don't really follow many new comics, but it'd probably be published by Image, right? It'd probably be creator-owned. There is no way in hell Marvel would publish this today, right? Everything has got to fit in to X-Men or Spider-Man or Avengers or tie in to the Marvel Universe, right? Like, yeah. I mean, granted, this is technically in the Marvel Universe, but just the fact that she's just a detective, and I don't know, I just think well, that... Well, actually, the original series here, these first five issues were not in the main Marvel ah, Universe. Ah, okay. Like, superheroes don't exist in this okay. world. But even better. once the series ended, they, broke, they put her in Web of Spider-Man and Power Pack and all that other stuff. Right. Um, Just so after, after he did Dakota North, uh, one through five, again, this was in 1986, he actually did night mask number one. Whoa. Yeah. So even though Jim Shooter did not like him when they were desperate for artists to do new universe, <laughs> they brought him in to do right. night mask number one. And, uh, he also did justice issue five, 1987. Really? So, so two new universe things. And then Mike L, you will know him from his work on GI Joe. He did issues 69, 87, 88, and 91. And those yep. were 1988 and 89. And again, that's Larry Hama giving him the work. And then uh, he also did G.I. Joe Yearbook Issue 4 in 1988. Yep, I remember that one. He's probably most famous. 
he also did some stuff at DC, um, but he's probably most famous for uh, 2008 and 2009. He did Strain- The Strange Adventures of H.P. Lovecraft. Really? Image Comics. Huh. And I guess that was successful and pretty uh, highly acclaimed. Uh, he was also a storyboard artist, Mike L., for Batman the Animated Series Season 1. Right. 1992. Right. And for Aeon Flux, 1995 really? on TV. Do you remember Aeon Flux? Actually, I don't. I've heard it. I've heard the name, but I've never. I don't oh, know that's it. right. You're Canadian. You don't have MTV. Oh. That's right. That's right. We got much music. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what else about him? Uh, colorist in, uh, well, I should say Mark Chiarello. Do you ever hear this guy? Chiarello. Mark no. Chiarello. He was a colorist and an editor, and he worked with Salmons. And he said that he described Salmons as, quote, an astonishingly, an astonishingly brilliant artist and a total flake. <laughs> and, really? Because Salmons is infamous for missing deadlines and burning bridges with editors. Jeez. His stuff was always late. But <clears throat> in a 2012 interview, uh, Salmons, this is a great interview, by the way. He does it with the cartoonist uh, Michelle Fife. F-I-F-F-E, but it's a fella, M-I-C-H-E-L. I'm guessing he pronounces it Michelle Fife. And uh, the interview is for a, a website called The Factual Opinion. So if you just Google up Tony Salmon's Factual Opinion, this uh, interview will come up. It's like a three-part interview. It is pretty spectacular. Cause he just, really? Yeah, because he just pulls no punches. He sounds like a very interesting fella. Like, he sounds like a true artist, you know? Like a, sure. One of those dudes, very intellectual. And, and he kind of just rips... Um, <laughs> The Marvel way back in the 80s and the, how the editors yeah. treated the creators and how the uh, upper management created, treated the creators and Jim Shooter and all that stuff. Okay, it, I just found it, yeah. Yeah, it's a very interesting interview to read. But uh, his quote about, in, he, he gave a quote about editors. And he said, quote, editors of Marvel and DC are unencumbered by talent. No talent. Zip. <laughs> zero. <laughs> so they have endless... Uh, Endless energies and time to uh, time on their hands for meddling with my shit. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he does not like editors. Right. So. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, I've got this interview. I'm looking forward to reading it. Yeah, definitely give it a read. It's pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, but he talks about Dakota North. He liked working with Martha, and uh, she liked working with him. No problems there. Uh, but yeah, I like his art. Like I said, it's very reminiscent of Sylvester and John Romita Jr. for me. Very reminiscent. Yeah, well, see, because it, it reminds me of other people. Like, uh, did you ever read that Spider-Man story, What's the Matter with Mommy? No. <laughs> okay. Well, it's written by Anne Lucenti and drawn by Cindy Martin, who did New Mutants for a while. And it reminds me of that as well. It's like, I, there was like this whole subgroup of artists at Marvel that kind of, well, they didn't draw the same, but I think it's just the fact that they drew nothing like John Buscema and Jack Kirby, right? Like, this is not the Marvel way. So I just think it really stands which, out. Yeah, which is why Jim Shooter said, you know, not to look like this. We don't right. look what's looking like this. And, if it, and that, that uh, Doctor Strange that he held up and said that about, that, was, that issue was written by Anna Senti. Ah, yeah. interesting. And, and Tony uh, Sammons had nothing but good things to say about Anna Senti. I, I think he said she's a sweetheart, quote, unquote. Mm, so. Yeah. We love Anna Senti here at Flea Market. Oh, Days. yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. But, uh, yeah, the art here, it's, you could tell it's a young artist, like, finding his stride, mm. like, you know, feeling his way. But it's still very good. Like, some yeah. compositions could be better. But the, the great thing about it is a, there's, like, an energy to it. And there's yep. a distinctive style. Yes. And um, so I really liked it. Really like I agree. Yeah, I've always liked him. Like, yeah, you could maybe argue some of the panels are a little sparse. Yes. Right? Like, but overall, yeah, it's good. He tells the story and it's it's got his own style. So yeah, I really like it. And again, yeah. a lot of credit goes to Larry Hama for uh shepherding him through it. You know, telling right. him what works and what doesn't and all that stuff. Right. But yeah, so there you go, Michael. Dakota North. Anything yeah. else you want to say about this? Uh only that if I were to have, like, again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier, but if there was someone who liked modern, you know, creator own books, but wanted to find, wanted to read something old, I would recommend this because, again, it does not read like a 1986 Marvel comic. It reads like a modern creator owned comic. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so look at that. 
What I, oh, geez, I, I dropped my microphone, Michael. Hold on. It's okay. I, I, I didn't hear it. It sounds fine. All right, good. All right, Michael. It's so a one out of 10, Dakota North number one. I got to go with an eight. You, you know what? I'm going to agree with you. Yeah. Right. Rock solid eight. Yeah. Like, again, if this was a, let's put it this way if this was a TV show on like Netflix or HBO, I'd be like, oh, this is a good TV show. But by Marvel 1986 standards, there was nothing else like this, right? Yeah. I, I, again, there are some flaws in the story, and the art's a little soft on occasion, but um, it's still really, really good. Yep. I agree. There Surprise. Yep. So that ad paid off, that style ad, eh? 30 <laughs> yep. years later. Yep. <laughs> Whew. All right. I guess that brings us to next week. Yes. Can I follow it up? Let's see. Okay. We're going to go back to Marvel next week. I like that you're picking all these Marvel books, Michael. Well, it's just kind of a coincidence, actually. Because I got a whole bunch of DC on the horizon. But anyway, it all timed out. There's a reason, there's a rhyme to my, there's a rhyme, what is it? There's a rhyme and reason to my insanity? I don't even know what I'm talking about. Anyway. Okay, so I'll give you one hint about this book, okay? Okay. There is a movie starring these characters coming out next Friday. <laughs> New Mutants again? You got it! <laughs> wow. New Mutants! Yeah, but we see, we did New Mutants by Chris Claremont and uh, Sal Buscema, right? Now we're going to do New Mutants by Chris Claremont and Bill Sienkiewicz. Oh. So it's New Mutants number 22, Once is Upon this, a Time. Is this part of the uh, Demon Bear thing? It actually is not, because oh. that's a multi-part story, so I figured we'll do a, a done-in-one, you know? Okay. But, uh, <sighs> yeah. yeah, New Mutants, Bill Sienkiewicz. It's pretty yep. good. I'm pumped. I mean, I've read this before, but it's been a long time, so. Our, our second New Mutants and our second Bill Sienkiewicz. Oh, that's right. Moon Knight. I forgot about that. Yep. yep. There you go. Huh. Maybe one day we'll do our second Dakota North, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, well, Cover we only got bit. four more. Hey, <laughs> we, we, we only got four a, more to do. <laughs> another podcast, right? I would love to do a Dakota North podcast. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so I guess that wraps up this week's episode. Uh, we do a new episode every week dedicated to a different Bronze Age comic. Uh, we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and on the Comic Book Syndicate website, all under the Comic Book Syndicate. And, and yeah, so I guess that's it. And until next Tuesday, disperse!